the breath. So it's the quality of that awareness that, that we're really cultivating. It's why, it's another reason why we say you cannot fail at this. You can't be having the wrong experience. You can have an experience you wouldn't want to write home about, but you know, uh, my next blog is going to be about sleepiness, restlessness, pain. You know, it's not what we really want, but it's okay. It's actually fine. So the fruits or the benefits of mindfulness are several also with, again, two primary ones. One that's very popular, one that is almost never talked about. Uh, and it's what Bob was alluding to yesterday. The first benefit is really inhabiting our lives. It is being able to go to Washington, D.C. and have your friends say, oh, it's past the peak, and not buying into that. It's seeing a thought as a thought and really being more in touch. Instead of like perpetually uh, falling into what uh, my friend Linda Stone calls continuous partial attention, which is sort of the way of our time, we're always multitasking, we're like all over the place, we can actually experience, like feel the warmth of the teacup and smell the tea and taste the tea. Normally we're drinking that cup of tea and we're also checking our email and also on the conference call and also watching the TV on mute reading the crawl. So it, doesn't tend to be really an extraordinary cup of tea, does it? And it is so rare that we look at the quality of our attention as playing any role at all in our degree of satisfaction. Mostly we blame the tea. <laughs> uh, I can't believe I still use tea bags. That is so stupid. I'm gonna go to that gourmet tea shop. I'm gonna buy all that loose tea. I'm gonna buy, I think I need a strainer and I need a tea ball. Maybe I don't need both, but anyway, I'll buy both just in case. <laughs> and I'll heat up the tea to that perfect temperature, whatever that is, like they do in England. And I'm going to make the perfect cup of tea. But if we make the perfect cup of tea and we drink it in just the way we drank the old cup of tea, it's not going to be very fulfilling. And then we're in a cycle, right? We're in a loop. What do I have to do? Do I have to go to India to get the tea right from the tea plantation? <laughs> So uh, some of you heard me say, I saw myself quoted on Twitter, which of course is just 140 characters or less. And it said, sometimes just drink the cup of tea, Sharon Salzberg. <laughs> and I thought that makes zero sense. <laughs> like none out of context, but it's what I'll be famous for, watch. Sometimes just drink the cup of tea. So when mindfulness is talked about, like on my Google alert, you know, when I get all those articles, this is what people are primarily talking about. And it's wonderful. You know, if we weren't so crazy trying with enormous futility, trying to find that perfect cup of tea and never noticing that we're not really there to experience it, it would be a better life. It would be a different world. The, Second benefit of mindfulness is really what the whole classical teaching is about, and that is using mindfulness for insight. It's not just having a better cup of tea and a better experience washing dishes, as wonderful as those are, but it's really understanding who we are in a whole other way. It's having very personal, direct insight into a lot of things. What really makes us happy? What brings us down? What causes us pain? There's so many things we do because we've just assumed or we've been taught, that's really great. That's going to bring you so much joy. And we actually look, it doesn't feel that good, in fact. We don't feel that powerful when we've told a lie. We actually feel kind of frightened about being found out or Endless fantasies of revenge on some very superficial level seem to be strong or give us strength. But let's really look in an unadorned, unembellished way. What does it really feel like? Just looping around again. It's like when you're 
going through the list of someone's faults and you go through it again and again and again and again. You don't even think of new faults. It's just like the same list again. Then you look at the clock and you think, oh my God, the whole morning's gone. What a way to spend a life. And we look at the things that maybe we've been taught bring us down, you know, make us weak, sentimental, foolish, like love, like compassion. And we look at them directly to understand their nature, their flavor, their, their texture. And we see the strength in that. Like, look at that. That didn't make me foolish. That didn't make me kind of overly sentimental and conflict avoidant and all of those things I had just assumed. So we develop insight from seeing clearly just the nature of our experience. We see who we are. And